I'll continue to good uh what is it today? Happy Thursday, everybody. Welcome to our um extension hot topics for where we are doing growing grapes with Miranda Purcell. Um, as you guys are joining in, um, I am gonna put the poll up uh for those of you who are uh tenured viewers of this. This is something that helps us. Oh, what's wrong? We do this is something that helps us with our um different um, recording that Purdue have, helps us do. So we'll take the first few minutes to kind of let people get into the um, into the Zoom call. And then, uh, as always, we will make sure to, if you could put your mute on and have uh, any questions you have, just direct them into the um, chat box just so we can kind of cover more material. There will be time at the end for questions. So uh, no worries there, but we'll try to get those all covered. Um, we will be, you know, 12 to 1 is our time frame. Uh, for those of you who have a &R educators in your county, we have three educators in the room right now because we are at our annual conference. So we are here to uh, do some learning, but this is one of our favorite programs. So we decided to make sure not to change the date because I know a lot of you guys do uh, view in live to get those um, live questions answered. So we'll give it just maybe one or two more minutes and then we'll go ahead and shut the poll down and give Miranda the uh, the floor, so. Yes, so this month is November, next month is December, and then we start 2024. Uh, we will be sending out information um, either through that email address, uh, the ones you get from Courtney Schmidt, um, or look at our Facebook pages for um, Miami, Howard, or Wabash. Um, we're going to try to advertise for our season three, which starts in January of 2024. You will need to re-register like you did at the beginning of 2023. Uh, this is just how Zoom works. Um, it's one of those things where it's easier for us to just get a new registration through Zoom. So um, just be on the lookout for that. But as always, if you can't make it or if you don't register in January, everything will be recorded so you can get those uh, Master Gardener hours, those different subjects. Um, those hour-long presentations done, and uh, we'll be good to go. So with that, it is now 12.03. If you guys could, again, get those answers in real quick, I'm going to give it about 20 more seconds, and then we will be beginning. Did I miss anything? Oh, I think so. All right, I'm going to end the poll, and then Miranda, the floor is yours. Awesome. Good afternoon, everybody. I guess it's afternoon now that it's just past 12, but thanks for joining me this afternoon. I was delighted to be asked to speak today on my favorite topic, which is growing grapes here in Indiana. And so as Jeff mentioned, feel free to ask questions as they arise, or we'll definitely have time at the end um, if anything comes up. I know a lot of people might be growing grapes themselves or might be interested in starting growing grapes. So I would love to do what I can to help you get started. But today I'm gonna to start with a little introduction about myself and about the grape growing and wine industry here in Indiana. And then I'm gonna talk about the work that Purdue does specifically with the industry. And then I'll end on a few of the most pressing issues that the grape industry deals with here in Indiana. And then we'll wrap it up. So a little bit about myself. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, I'm the viticulture extension specialist here at Purdue and viticulture does mean the science of grape growing. And so that's my main focus. I grew up in Zionsville, Indiana, just Northwest of Indianapolis. And I went to Hope College in Holland, Michigan where I studied biology and fell in love with Lake Michigan. And then when I decided I wanted to study horticulture and specifically viticulture, I got an opportunity to um, study at Oregon State University, which is where I first learned about grapes. They have a huge industry out there. I didn't come from a farming background and I wasn't even old enough to drink wine when I started, but I sure learned a lot. And I'm seeing the chat that some people are requesting whether there will be samples today. Unfortunately, in a virtual setting, that's a little bit harder to do, but um, maybe next time. And after I graduated from Oregon State studying viticulture, I spent a few years at Colorado State University. They have a small grape industry, pretty similar in size to what we have here in Indiana. 
And I was delighted to be able to move back home a little over two years ago to be closer to family and to work in the unique climate that we have here in Indiana and helping grape growers across the state. Uh, not many people know, but we do have more than 120 wineries across the state of Indiana. And alongside that, we have more than 600 acres of vineyard. That might sound like a high number to some people, but it puts it in perspective when I attend some annual, some national conferences with folks from California or the West Coast. I was sitting at a table this past summer with a bunch of extension folks from California, and they said they work with individual growers that have more than 600 acres. So that's more than we have in our entire state. So that really put things in perspective, but we aren't alone. There's uh, the whole Midwestern region is really growing in terms of its capabilities for growing grapes and really getting on the map in terms of wine production. And so that's really great. In terms of the amount of the gallons of wine produced in Indiana, we produce more than 2.4 million gallons a year. And this is in large part due to one winery in the Bloomington area. If anyone has any ideas or guesses, feel free to enter those in the chat. But we are lucky to have one of the largest wineries in the country outside of the states of Washington, California, and Oregon. And that is Oliver Winery, which yeah, is located. Yep. Oliver Winery, located in Bloomington, Indiana. They have their market is sweet wines, which may seem pretty common here in the Midwest, but across the country and the world, they have a really unique place in the market with their style of wines. And so even though we don't have very many wineries and vineyard acres here in our state, we definitely are on the map in terms of wineries in large part because of Oliver Winery. They used to have the largest vineyard in the state, but recently Country Heritage Winery up near Fort Wayne overtook that role and they have 101 acres of grapes. And so the rest of the vineyards around the state are smaller in size on average between three to five acres. And there are a few, a bunch of backyard growers or folks who have just a row of vines all the way up to, like I said, that 101 acres. And the 120 wineries is a 200% increase since 2006. And so our industry here is definitely growing, which is super exciting. And as you can see, the blue dots indicate wineries across the state. So they aren't localized in any particular area. They're pretty well dispersed, but I do wanna to touch on some of the two major, what we call American viticultural areas. This is also sometimes called an AVA and that's a federally designated wine grape growing region. And the key here is that they these areas are discernible by their climate, geography, and soil type. And so even though there's vineyards across the state, we do have two AVAs. We have the Indiana Uplands AVA, which spreads from Bloomington down to the southern part of the state. And then we also have the Ohio River Valley AVA, which we share with parts of Ohio, Kentucky, and West Virginia. And I wanted to highlight the Indiana Uplands AVA. It's comprised of, I think, almost a dozen wineries and they've grouped together to form what one might call a wine trail. So way easy ways to get to and from a lot of these wineries in this one region. And the main reason why these AVAs are important is because it gives wines more of a sense of place. And so instead of these wineries just being able to say they are Indiana wine, if you're in this AVA, you can specify even further that your grapes were grown in the Indiana Uplands region. So I've highlighted a bottle of 
Terra Rosa wine from Butler Winery, which is in Bloomington. And you can see there that it says that they are part of the Indiana Uplands region. And so this can distinguish, this is a way for them to distinguish themselves from some of the no, more Northern wineries and can really help people recognize this area. For example, every state has, or not every state, but a lot of the states that grow grapes have multiple AVAs. I think there's more than a hundred AVAs in California alone. So Napa Valley, Sonoma County, all those even have multiple AVAs within themselves. And so I always just like to touch on that in case you ever see the Indiana Uplands or Ohio River Valley designation on a bottle of wine. So that's a little intro about the Indiana wine grape industry. And now I wanna to touch on the Purdue Wine Grape Team, which is a collaboration between the Food Science Department and Horticulture Department here at Purdue. And our goal is to serve Indiana's vintners and growers by providing expertise on grape growing and winemaking and marketing. And our ultimate goal is to propel the Indiana wine grape industry into world-class competitiveness. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what I do on a daily basis. And I work with grape growers um, starting from backyard growers all the way up to folks who have more than 100 acres of grapes. And I work with beginning growers, folks who are interested in planting, who have a plot of land and are interested in planting grapes, all the way up to folks who have been growing for more than 20 to 20 years. And so it's really exciting opportunity. I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one site visits, especially during the when the grapes are growing, um, I usually don't hear much when during harvest because a lot of the growers are pretty busy that time of year, but the calls pick back up in the fall once harvest is over and people trying to troubleshoot some of the problems they dealt with that season. Um, I also host webinars such as this or pruning workshops. We held a pruning workshop last March here at the Migs Horticulture Research Farm in Lafayette. And then I also produce videos and fact sheets on timely topics. And we have a newsletter to get out a lot of this information. I also help teach Hort 318, which is a field production of horticulture crops here on campus. So I am located on campus in West Lafayette. And I do enjoy, really enjoy working with students. And so I teach the fruit portion of that class, which is, always fun and we're just wrapping up the semester here. I can hardly believe it. And then I also help plan the Indiana Horticulture Conference and Expo, which is held in January of each year. And this year it'll be held at the Hendricks County Fairgrounds in Danville. And this is a time to learn about vegetable and fruit crops from Purdue specialists and specialists that we invite from around the country. And so, I have a slide at the end that can let you know how to register if you're interested in joining us this year. Here are just some photos of what I do. Um, <clears throat> we had a series of red and white wine workshops last winter. And so we visited, we had, <clears throat> had a workshop at Huber Winery and then also at Mallow Run Winery. And then on the top right here, we see a field day where I highlighted at the Purdue Student Farm where I highlighted our high tunnel table grape project, which I'll talk about in a little bit. On the bottom left is the Hort 318 class learning about pruning grapevines. And then we also have a summer field day at the Meg's Horticulture Research Farm every year. And that's what you see there in the bottom right. So that's my main extension responsibilities. And then I wanted to touch on a little bit of the research that we're conducting. Purdue has one main vineyard located at the Miggs Horticulture Research Farm, which is approximately 10 miles south of campus. Some folks might be familiar with that location. Um, they've hosted some pruning workshops there in the past. And then there, we're conducting a variety trial that was 
planted by my predecessor, Dr. Bruce Bordelon. Some folks might be familiar with him as well. He retired in 2020 and he set up a trial that tests more than 20 different varieties. And this is really crucial information to have because Indiana is such a unique climate for growing grapes. It's important to know which varieties can survive our winters, um, which how varieties do in terms of disease resistance and how vigorous they are. And so this trial is really set up to inform Indiana grape growers if someone's interested in planting a vineyard, as I mentioned, or planting a new, adding a new variety to their vineyard, we can share with them the data that we've collected on these varieties over the past 20 years and let them know our recommendations based on cold hardiness, disease resistance, et cetera. So it's a really valuable resource that we have this trial going on. We also have um, a small table grape planting at the Southwest Purdue Ag Center, which is, I've highlighted the Purdue Ag Centers of which there's about seven or eight across the state. And so TPAC is Throckmorton Purdue Ag Center, which uh, coincides with MIGS that I mentioned here in Lafayette. And then the Southwest Purdue Ag Center is down near Vincennes. So we have some seedless table grape varieties growing there. And then just last year, we started a table grape trial at the Purdue Student Farm here on campus. And this trial I'll talk about on the next slide here. But I'm gonna see if this video might work. I should have tested the sound on it. But this just shows what it's like to harvest grapes at MIGS in the fall, and I believe this was taken two years ago. So hey, Marie. Yeah. Sorry, uh, we did have a question um, about uh, the slide said the region also identifiable by soil types um, with blended soil types in middle Indiana. Um, is there a way to kind of gauge that or just kind of how to, how to see if your soils are good or not for that sort of thing? Yeah, definitely. I'm oh, sorry, I let me pause this video. Um, there are some, I would recommend collecting a soil sample and sending it off to a lab and I can provide some recommendations on labs in your area, but we would look at a few things like or pH, organic matter content, and determine if there's any amendments that need to be made to the soil before we would recommend planting grapes. And so there's also a way you can look up your soil type through the web soil and NRCS web soil survey. So when I, I can provide some resources at the end and I'll be sure to include those two links, if that would help. That would be great. And I guess one thing I'm looking at too is there's definitely a relationship. The more land you have, definitely the more money you're going to be spending on those soil amendments and those different uh, inputs that we need to help grapes. Okay, great. Yeah. And so let me see if it'll let me share this video. We can see the video, Miranda. Cool. Harvest usually starts in late August for us and ends late September or early October. This year we had a late frost in around Mother's Day, so late May, and that ended up killing off some of the buds that we have on the grapevines, but luckily we're not seeing much damage. A lot of our early varieties were affected, but they have some secondary and tertiary buds that were able to push and give rise to good growth and a good crop. We were worried about cicada damage. I have a few reports of small damage, but overall they did not cause significant damage 
And so across the state, we're looking at relatively high yields this year and in the harvest state, maybe a, about a week later than last year. My research is based on evaluating different methods of production for sweet potatoes. What are some of the techniques? Hey, Miranda, we're not seeing the video on this one. Okay, yeah, I didn't mean to play that one. I'm just getting back to the... Oh, gotcha, gotcha. And as we're kind of moving through stuff, any questions, good questions coming through here, um, especially for those, if you guys want to grow grapes, uh, this is the time to be asking questions because... Uh, with Miranda being the state specialist, a lot of folks do some trial and error. Um, just understand that, you know, she has the experience or at least the resources to help you get started. Because from my experience with people that I've worked with, it's not necessarily easy, is it? No. And it's always nice to do all your homework ahead of time and do all your research ahead of time and double check what's the best tactic to go with because sometimes you'll get a call from somebody who planted grapes three years ago and they planted a variety that probably won't survive and so I'm always excited when people reach out to me before they get started and are planning ahead and so yeah that's a great point all right can you see the powerpoint again yes okay awesome so I touched briefly on the Research we have going on at MIGS in Lafayette and the Southwest Purdue Ag Center in Vincennes. And then last year, we just started a table grape high tunnel trial at the Purdue Student Farm on campus. And so when I say table grapes, I usually mean seedless eating grapes or like the grapes that you can buy at the store, as opposed to grapes that are used for making wine, which is the majority of the work we do at MIGS. And so this trial was set up based on a study done at the University of Arkansas, where they found that by growing table grapes underneath a high tunnel, as you see in this photo, as opposed to in an open field, they found three main benefits. Typically after planting grapevines, it takes four years until you get any fruit. And they found that they were able to decrease that by a year or two, so getting fruit two or three years after planting instead of four can make a big difference in terms of starting to make a profit. They also saw three times the yield for the vines that were growing in the high tunnel versus in the uh, open field. And because the vines are protected from the rain, they saw a decrease in disease pressure, which disease is a pretty big issue because of our hot, humid climate here in Indiana. And so being able to protect grapevines from disease and not have to spray the vines as much can be a huge plus. And so we are doing this trial, like I said, here to see if it's feasible for to do this in Indiana. And these vines were planted last year, so we haven't had much data to collect yet, but one of the unexpected outcomes that we've had is that the vines that were planted underneath the high tunnel were protected from frost. And I'll talk about frost damage in a few slides more specifically, but the vines underneath the high tunnel didn't die off when we had a freeze event this past May. And so I foresee that being another great benefit of this sort of work. Hey, Miranda, quick uh, quick question was brought up, and this kind of goes back to soil. Um, this individual said that they have a relatively high pH of 7.5 plus in northeast Indiana with lots of clay. Um, is this suitable for growing grapes, or will it likely need lots of soil amendments? Uh, yeah, the ideal pH for growing grapes is between 5.5 and 6.5, so we would want to bring that pH down um, so depending on the number of grapevines you're interested in planting, if it's just a few, that could be feasible. It might be a little harder to do if you're thinking of planting on a large scale. Thanks, Miranda. Yeah. And as I mentioned, one of my favorite aspects of my job is getting to work with students. And I get to do that through teaching the class. But 
I also usually hire about five students every fall to help harvest grapes at MIGS. And I've been lucky over the past few years to get some really enthusiastic students from a bunch of different backgrounds. You would think they would all be studying horticulture, but I've had folks from nursing program, the nursing program, the pharmacy program, electrical engineering. And so it's a really fun time to teach people about growing grapes and harvesting grapes. And we also have the class come join us and the Purdue Student Farm Club is always excited to come out every year. You can see a picture of their group in the top right. This was taken, that photo was taken two years ago, but this past year we had more than 40 students show up to help harvest grapes. I didn't, didn't even have enough harvest shears for all of them. So I'll have to plan ahead next year because they're always bringing a lot of enthusiasm out to the vineyard. So I look forward to that each year. And so that's a little bit about how Purdue works with the Indiana grape industry. And I'm gonna end by touching on a few of the challenges that, the, that we deal with here in Indiana. I touched briefly on our climate, but um, cold damage is the number one issue that we deal with in trying to grow grapes in Indiana. And so we'll talk about that first. Um, not only do we have cold winters, but more and more frequently, frequently we're having late spring frosts. I think it was in two of the last three years, uh, in late May around Mother's Day, we had a frost event. So temperatures below 32 degrees. And a lot of the time this is after the grapevine shoots have already started growing for the year. And that gives rise to a situation like you see in this photo. So we have a green, beautiful shoot growth, and then the cold temperatures um, just kind of torch it and kill off that entire shoot. This shoot will no longer produce any fruit. And so this can be extremely detrimental on a large scale. Uh, there is opportunity, grapevines do have a tertiary or have um, compound buds. And so even though this primary shoot was killed off in the freeze, there is the potential for a secondary or tertiary shoot to still start growing and produce, potentially produce fruit, but those secondary and tertiary buds are a lot less fruitful. So no matter what, we're looking at um, decreased yield, if any yield at all. And so the main thing that I do as for my role as an extension specialist in this case is try to educate growers on which grape varieties to plant because they have varying degrees of being able to withstand midwinter temperatures. And also they start growing at different times throughout the year. And so there's the potential to avoid a damage from a spring frost event like this. So a lot of times I like to ask folks which grape varieties they're familiar with. And I often get comments like Chardonnay, Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, Pinot Noir. And I have to burst people's bubbles by saying, you won't see any of those varieties grown here in Indiana. Those are our typical, are classic European varieties that are native to Europe and are grown all along the West Coast here in the US. You can find a lot of them in Michigan because Michigan is surrounded by lakes. They have the lake effect, which really tempers their climate and allows them to grow those varieties. But here in Indiana, we almost exclusively grow or at least promote at this time, uh, cold hardy hybrid varieties. These are French American hybrids. So it's a hybridization between those European varieties and varieties that are native to North America. And the varieties that are native to North America uh, helps impart not only cold hardiness, but also some degree of disease resistance into a lot of these varieties. And so luckily 
The University of Minnesota and Cornell have done a lot of work in recent years on trying to breed varieties specifically for growing in the Midwest. And so I've highlighted a few of the top variety, top cold hardy varieties here, but Vidal and Vignoles are some of the more popular white wine varieties. And Brianna was a newer, newly developed variety a few years ago. And they're showing a lot of promise. And then on the red wine side, we have a variety called Chamberson, which is one of my personal favorites. Um, it's cold hardy enough to grow in the southern half of Indiana, but we don't really recommend it for the northern half of the state. But Marquette, Frontenac, and Noré are some of the other newly developed varieties. And like I said, when folks are interested in getting into grape growing in Indiana, I will let them know that these are the varieties that, so these are examples of the varieties that we've been testing out at MAKES. And so we have a lot of data on how they perform. And it's also nice to have the site down in Vincennes because we can trial some of these varieties in the Southern half of the state to see how well they grow there as well. And so variety selection is a huge part of working with new growers because it can really make or break their situation, whether they're able to have their grapevines survive or if they're gonna get killed off in a frost every year. Miranda, I, there was a couple yeah. questions in the box. Um, I'm gonna butcher this, but one question was, I don't see the Traumane uh, on the list. Yep. Is that the grape of Indiana, Traumane? Yep, so Traumane was a variety developed by Cornell I want to say in the mid 2000s, um, and there was a big push to plant Traumanet all across Indiana, I want to say in 2015 or 2017, um, because it was showing a lot of promise. However, since then, we've realized that it wasn't quite as cold hardy as we thought. And so a lot of the Traumanet that was planted hasn't made it through the more recent winters. And this may very well have to do with global warming and how we're experiencing a lot more extreme weather events. Uh, for example, the cold snap that happened right before Christmas last year, where the temperature dropped 30 or 40 degrees in a matter of hours, um, that caused a lot of damage to some varieties. And then also the spring frosts that I've talked about um, so we don't really recommend Traumanet anymore, and we're not sure if, like I said, it's a climate change problem or if the planting stock that folks are getting a hold of now isn't the same as the planting stock of the originally tested varieties, which we thought would be able to thrive here in Indiana. So that's a little bit of the backstory on why you don't see it there. No, I appreciate that, Miranda. Um, the other thing kind of going uh, along with that, um, so since a new hardy, a new zone hardiness map has been recently released, how do you see that affecting grapes in the industry? Uh, that's a great question. I just probably about an hour ago saw that newly released map. And I was, I think there's quite a bit of a shift in Indiana. And so um, it could definitely affect our recommendations because in the past we pretty much divided the state along I-70. And so We'll have to take a look at our data, like I said, and compare from our Lafayette site and our Vincennes site to see if we can recommend some varieties for the southern parts of the state that we don't necessarily recommend up here. But I haven't had the chance to take a look at it in depth quite yet, but I could definitely foresee some shifts happening. No, that was one of those uh, real-time questions because, again, uh talking with some of the other extension educators, we're always on the lookout for stuff like that. So we appreciate you uh, kind of looking at that. I myself have not looked at that, so I need to do so. Um, the other thing is, uh, another question was, are you going to push for a new state grape? And is that something on your radar? And how can we help? What would it be? That's a great question because a lot of states have had some great success behind doing that. For example, when I think of Oregon, I think of Pinot Noir, and I'm sure their state tourism agencies have done that on purpose. And so 
the idea with Traminette was to try to get people to associate Indiana with a particular variety to help marketing and help um, consumers. It's a really big deal, especially with the cold hardy varieties that aren't as familiar to the general public to try to promote them the best we can. And so I foresee there are no plans currently. I've heard some growers um, just imagining what varieties they would choose if we did pick if we did pick um, a new grape variety or varieties. There's been talk about having one red variety and one white variety. Um, but also going back to the new cold hardiness map, there are some pretty dis different climates that we have. There is a little bit of a dividing line across the state. So how do we take that into account when we're trying to um, promote the entire state. And so there, it's not in the works right now. Um, I could see it definitely having benefits, but we'd have to figure out the right way to go about it. No, we appreciate that input. Um, maybe we'll do a, a Northern variety and a Southern variety, right? Yeah. Yeah. One could be red, one could be white. That's definitely, that could be a possibility. Um, and then I, was there another question? I'm sorry, I didn't think, but I think those are all the questions for now. So yeah, so thanks for uh, letting us kind of take a minute there and answer those. Yeah, it makes sense to answer them while we're talking about it. But I'm just, um, the second issue I wanted to talk about is herbicide drift. Um, as you know, we are a huge corn and bean producing state and a lot of the chemicals used on corn and beans are extremely harmful to grapevines. Grapevines are extremely sensitive to 2,4-D and dicamba. And not only are these used on corn and bean farms, but um, lawn, people use them in their lawn. Um, and so we get a lot of cases where the grapevines are accidentally either sprayed or we have what we call a drift event. And so the product was applied, but maybe under the wrong weather conditions, and the particles ended up drifting and affecting a nearby grapevine. And the symptoms are pretty easy to spot. As you can see, we usually get cupping of the grapevine leaves and um, like fanning of the tips or the edges of the leaf with dicamba. And then 2,4-D, we often get a fan leaf shape so just a huge distortion of the, and all the veins running in the same direction. And so I should have put a, on here a slide of what a healthy leaf looks like, but it's pretty easy to spot. And so a lot of the work that we do around this is encouraging grape growers to communicate with their neighbors, let them know that they're growing a sensitive crop. And there is a program called Drift Watch where you can register your location and what crop you're growing. And anyone that is applying pesticides in your area is required to check that website. And so they should be made aware of your location and your situation. And so um, we also work with the Office of the Indiana State Chemist. They handle some of the claims about damage on a larger scale. And so this is an ongoing issue um, there are some, there is a date after which spraying some of these chemicals each year is prohibited. And so that has helped because grapevines usually start growing in April or May, and then we harvest them in August, September, and October. So that has helped to some degree, but just with where, what our state focuses on, this will definitely be an ongoing issue. The third issue I wanted to talk about is pest control, specifically bird control. Um, we do get a lot of bird pressure, deer pressure, raccoons feeding on our grapevines, but bird pressure seems to be the most common. Um, and we see this starting when the grapevines, when the berries start ripening, which can be in July or August. And the bird pressure can continue through harvest, which I just mentioned, and uh, ends usually in October. And so once a bird or a flock of birds finds some grapes, usually they invite all their friends 
And so it can lead to some pretty significant damage. There was just a study released by the Michigan State University and they determined that their, their state experiences among, among the most bird um, pressure across the country. They've seen crop losses ranging from 60 to 95%. And it does vary greatly depending on uh, the color of grape you're growing because red grapes are a lot easier to see, especially when they start ripening. And so those are often targeted and especially the varieties that start ripening earlier, um, birds are on the lookout and ready to start feeding. And so those early red varieties are often what we focus on the most. And we often see higher pressure in vineyards that are surrounded by forests or other vegetation where the birds can habitat, habitate. In terms of control options, there are a number of options out there. In the image here, you can see bird netting. So they have put the netting along the fruit zone of the individual rows, and then they've also put it around the exterior of the vineyard. You may also see streamers or those blow up guys that you see at the car dealership placed in vineyards. Anything to try to disturb the visual, the bird's visuals. Um, and there's also speakers that put out bird distress calls or bird cannons. And more recently, there's been some interest in using lasers. And this is, could potentially be a pretty sustainable option. And what you can do is program lasers to survey and do certain patterns over a particular vineyard block and the birds see that when the laser comes near them, uh, they see it as a threat and they fly away. And so we were just approached by a laser company and we're potentially going to be doing a study on the feasibility of using lasers at, to control birds here at Meigs in Lafayette. So that could be super exciting. And I've worked with some growers who have bird pressure every single year and have to net or else they'll lose their crop. And I've worked with folks who have never had any problems with birds and can get away without doing anything. So it's really variety specific, site specific, um, but the people who it affects, it can be super detrimental. So I look forward to trying to see if lasers is a feasible option for some of our growers to use. And then the last issue that we deal with here in Indiana, not, well, the list is unending, but the last one I wanted to highlight today is that of in invasive species, specifically the spotted lanternfly, which I'm sure a lot of us have heard of by now, but this is an invasive plant hopper that was native to East Asia, but it made its way to Pennsylvania in 2014, and it has since spread to more than 15 states. It um, has now made its way into three different locations in Indiana, two of which you can see on this map here. But this past summer, it was also found in the Elkhart region. And so there are three populations that the DNR is currently monitoring. Um, and we are trying to do what we can to keep those populations under control and prevent further spread. And the reason this insect is such a problem is because it is known as a hitchhiker species. And this is also the reason why it's spreading so quickly. But here's a photo of the different stages of the life cycle. And the one I wanted to highlight is the egg mass stage here in the top middle. And so females will lay their eggs, lay 40 to 60 eggs, and then cover it with a cement or mud-like covering. And they usually lay these eggs on any vertical hard surface. And that can include railway cars, semi trucks. Um, and as you can imagine, those cars are making their way across the country. And so that has really contributed to the quickness that this insect has spread across the state, across the country. And the reason this affects, it has more than 70 different host species, but one of its preferred species 
to feed on is indeed the grapevine. And what the insect will do is it'll use its piercing sucking mouth part, kind of like a straw to suck the sap out of grapevines. And this can lead to weakened growth and this can actually cause grapevine death, especially when coupled with other stressors such as cold damage or disease pressure. And so Pennsylvania has a huge grape growing industry and they are the center of where the spotted lanternfly is infesting. And so they have estimated that the spotted lanternfly has caused more than $300 million of damage each year to their grape industry. And so we wanna be proactive and we're working with the DNR and the entomology department here at Purdue to try to figure out when this insect does enter some of our vineyards and other areas of crops that are sensitive, what's the right process to go through to manage these insects and try to prevent as much damage as possible. And so if you ever think you spot this insect, um, please report it to the DNR. There's a phone number and email address there to contact. The earlier hey, we can- Hey, Miranda. No, hey, uh, we appreciate, uh, this is all great information. Um, We will be going into Lanternfly actually next month. So if you want to kind of, I mean, this is great stuff, but, um, and it has served as a great preview, but if you're okay with kind of switching back to grapes, because yeah. uh, we're getting some good questions if, if uh, once you get the slides done, um, if that's okay with you. Yeah, sure. That was my last issue that we're dealing with. And yeah, I just wanted to highlight it because grapes are one of the top species that it targets. And so we're definitely keeping an, our eye on that. But with that, I just wanted to end by again mentioning that Indiana Horticulture Conference, which will be held January 22nd and 23rd at the Hendricks County Fairgrounds. Um, we would love for you to join us I have the link, I will include the link to register and the link with information on the topics in the chat. And then another way that you can stay up to date on what's happening in the grape growing industry is we have a newsletter called Facts for Fancy Fruit. And so Purdue puts this out throughout the growing season and it includes not only grapes, but also blueberries, strawberries, and apples and other tree fruit. And so if you're interested in staying up to date with what's going on in the fruit industry in Indiana, I will also include the link on how to join that. But with that, I'd be happy, happy to answer any questions. Yeah, we had uh, the first one I'm seeing is um, how many vines must be planted together to help with pollination? So I'm assuming that means what's a good stand of grapes to be planting? Um, grapevines are actually self-pollinated. And so they don't need any other, any nearby vines or any vines of other varieties to pollinate them. Um, usually the wind does the job of moving the pollen. Um, so bees aren't necessary, but of course they're welcome to help with the pollination process. But yes, grapevines are self-pollinated, so you really only need one. Excellent. Um, the next question I see is uh, if you could talk about pruning vines, uh, just kind of the quick when and how. Sure. So best time to prune grapevines is in the early spring. Uh, we try to hold off until the after the last frost. But like I mentioned, they're becoming later and more unpredictable as the years go on. Um, but we usually try to recommend that folks prune in middle or late May. Um, and when pruning grapevines, you want to, your vine will produce fruit on the one year old wood. So the wood that grew last year will produce fruit in the coming year. So that's the main focus of what you're working with when you're pruning. Um, and you want to try to get rid of about 90% of the wood that grew last year and leave only 10% because the fewer buds that remain, the vine will be able to put all of its resources and nutrients towards and help improve the size and quality of those grapes and berries. And I'll include some resources that talk more specifically about 
pruning details and general managing grapevine details for the resource section. Perfect. Um, we'll be uh, when we send out our email to those uh, who are on our mailing list. We'll be sure to include uh, Purdue Extensions and Purdue University's um pruning resources so that you guys can have those. But uh, great, you put it in there or you put the the conference in there. But yeah, we'll make sure everyone gets those resources. So I'm not seeing a whole lot of new questions in the chat box. Um, so for now, I might uh go ahead and stop recording. But yeah, oh, we do have another question. Um. Rose bushes planted at the end of rows as a sign of vine health. Is that something that you've heard of or worked with uh, in your in your position? Um, I haven't worked with it directly, but I've definitely been to vineyards who have a rose bush planted uh, at the end of every row. And the idea there being is that roses are a sense, super sensitive crop, just like grapes, but they can sometimes pick up diseases before grapevines do. And so if you see a certain disease on a rose, on the rose at the end of your row, it might be a good idea to scout your vineyard and or spray to try to prevent that disease from entering your vineyard. So yes, it is done. Um, and it can be pretty helpful in some situations. Thanks, Miranda. Um, any other questions, throw them in the chat box. Otherwise, um, it did kind of slow down there. So I'm going to stop recording. And Marina, if you're okay with hanging out for the next few minutes, um, we can just kind of chill and see if anything else comes out. But we appreciate you coming on. Um, lots of good information. And uh, hopefully we get some more people growing grapes out there. And um, But yeah, appreciate you coming on. And uh, we might have you back on in a year or two to see what the update is for, for growing grapes in Indiana. Sure. Happy to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation.